Our next speaker was one of the first names on my list when I was planning this conference. Mark Huddleston joined the Rotary Club of Edwardstown in 1997 at the age of just 29, after already doing 10 years in Rotaract. Now aged 51, Mark has been involved with Rotary for well over half his life. He was Edwardstown Club President in 2006-2007 and has served in senior district leadership roles for eight years, including three years as the District 9520 Membership Chair. He's also the administrator of the District 9520 Facebook page and a regular blogger on Rotary membership issues and has authored a number of articles for the Rotary Down Under magazine. In November 2016, Mark transferred into the newly chartered Rotary Club of Seaford, a club that he was instrumental in forming. He's a much sought after commentator on Rotary's membership challenges and has spoken on over 200 occasions about membership to clubs and at numerous pets and other conferences and seminars around Australia and New Zealand. In March 2018, Mark published his first book, Creatures of Habit, about the underlying causes of membership decline and perhaps how we can turn things around. So Rotarians, please welcome, all the way from Australia, Mr. Mark Huddleston. Good morning, uh, Rotarians in the UK. Uh, good evening from Australia. Um, it's uh, it's wonderful to be joining you. I'm just going to push a few buttons here, and uh, in theory, I'm going to be able to share my screen. So I've got a um, PowerPoint presentation to run. So let's just hope uh, everything works here. Bear with us; won't be a tick. And here we go. All righty, Alistair, can you just give me a thumbs up that everyone can see, or that at least you can see that screen? <laughs> Beautiful. Um, yeah, look, thanks again. It's lovely to be, enjoying, to be joining you in Scotland. I, I wish I could join you in person, which was the plan about October last year. The Huddleston clan actually comes from Scotland many, many years ago, and I was very much looking forward to getting over there and doing a little bit of um, research on the family history. But uh, the day will come, and I, I promise I'll get over there at some stage. So thanks very much uh, for the opportunity. Um, some of the things I talk about, uh, people don't really like to hear. Um, I'd have to say when it comes to membership, um, there, are, there are really no great mysteries. There's, there's not really too many membership questions that we don't collectively have the answers for. And I would suggest to you that our membership decline is not about a lack of knowledge, but a lack of will. So really what I want to share with you today is, is, a, is a bit of knowledge. Um, a few of the things I've discovered from the process of being a district membership chair, from the process of uh, researching and writing my book and also from the process of uh, chartering a new club uh, from thin air. But um, uh, I, I don't think it serves any real purpose to, to join these sort of um, conferences and seminars and tell people what they want to hear. Um, so, so, you know, I, I do reiterate that some of these things aren't going to be easy to hear. Just very quickly, uh, a bit of a, a gloss over of what's going on in Australia. And a lot of my experiences are, of course, from Australia. But um, when it comes to Rotary culturally, um, this can, has perhaps been replicated right across the Western world. So I don't doubt for an instant that the UK are, are suffering very similar statistics, if not in numbers, at least in percentage. Um, when I joined the organisation back in 1997 in Australia, we had just under 40,000 members. Now, fast forward to February this year, we're down to 25,000. Uh, the number of clubs have dropped off considerably as well, as you can no doubt see. That's a net loss of over 14,000 members in um, about uh, 20, almost 24 years, which is a third of our membership base here in Australia. And often when I use words such as membership crisis, I sort of get pulled up for being, uh, you, you know, inflammatory and, and using terms that maybe um, aren't correct. I would suggest... Um, if you don't think we're in the midst of a membership crisis, you probably need to pull out your dictionary. Um, and just before I leave this page, and I promise you I won't hit you with um, statistics the whole way through, I do just want to highlight this concept of net loss. We do talk a lot in terms of net gains and net loss. And whilst that figure there of 14,107 members net loss over that period is accurate, um, we're often missing out on a lot of the detail when we talk about net loss, because I would suggest over that almost quarter of a century, we probably uh, recruited 20,000 members. We would have chartered well over 200 clubs. So um, the figures of 14,000 is 
is an accurate figure, but we're only hearing half of the story. So just remember that whenever you talk about net losses and net gains. Uh, and on that very subject, uh, the, rate, the rate of people leaving Rotary, um, particularly in the Western world, but certainly here in Australia, has pretty much remained steady every year for about the last quarter century. The problem is the rate of people, people joining has dropped off considerably. So as a result, the numbers seem to be dropping every single year. Um, and there's a, there's, a, um, there's a great way of looking into at club level what's going on in every club. There's a, an official RI document called the RI Health Check. It's about eight pages long and there's lots of ticks and crosses and surveys in there. I definitely recommend every club downloading that. Uh, I'm sure your district leaders can make that available to you. Uh, and perhaps running that check at least every one or two years. But I have a very simple barometer to gauge um, how well your club is, how well your club is, is performing. And that's quite simply this question. Are you able to recruit against your losses? Now I put it to you in even the best functioning clubs, the clubs with the best morale, the clubs with the highest numbers, the clubs raising the most money, doing the most projects, we have unavoidable losses uh, that are completely outside um, the governance of what's going on in the club, and we must be able to recruit against those losses. Unfortunately, most clubs have not been able to recruit uh, against their losses over the last sort of quarter century ago, and that's why a lot of clubs have had to hand in their charter. What I want to do now is go through my top five reasons that clubs have not been able to recruit against their losses over the last, say, quarter century or so. And I want to make this very clear. This is uh, not official RI commentary. Um, these are the reasons I've come up with uh, through the process, again, of being a district membership chair, starting a new club, blogging on membership for quite some time, and of course, the research and process of writing a book. So hopefully RI official would agree with a lot of this, but uh, I do want to make that clear. These are my top five reasons. Uh, reason number five, that we've been unable to recruit against our losses, we're no longer seen as relevant. Here's a bit of a snapshot of what's going on in a lot of uh, clubs right across the Western world. There's three major things that are happening. Number one, the clubs are getting smaller. Number two, the members are getting older. And number three, fewer of our members are working. We have a larger percentage of our members who are retirees. So what does that mean? Well, it means we're ras rapidly losing our capacity to do two really important parts of Rotary. And they are serving our community because our members are older and we have fewer of them and networking because fewer of our members are engaged in full-time employment. And a lot of those uh, business networks are starting to atrophy. And people might wonder, well, sort of, so what? I would suggest to you that given uh, that uh, even given our uh, challenge in public image and getting our message out there, um, most of the general public would at least recognize Rotary as those two things, people who serve the community and people who network. And if, if you cast your mind back 115 odd years ago to the start of the organization, we were started as a business networking organization, which quickly morphed into a community service organization. So over our history, community service and networking have been two really important pillars of the organization. And I think we're starting to lose our relevance because we're starting to lose our capacity to do those two things. Here's reason number four is ineffective communication. Our messaging is inconsistent, it's confusing, it's under-resourced and it's often misdirected. And when I talk about communication, I'm talking about both internal communication and external communication. Uh, I think the average Rotarian has a lot of conflicting messages going on inside their mind um, about Rotary, what we stand for, what we do. Of course, we've got a motto, service above self. Um, we've got a vision statement and a mission statement. I would challenge most Rotarians to be able to recite those. Of course, we have our four-way test. We have five avenues of service. We now have seven international areas of focus. We have a lot of conflicting messages uh, and we struggle to convey uh, a narrative to the world about what it is we do and what we stand for. And if that's not confusing enough, of course, we, we, we then go and change our theme every year just to make it a little bit more confusing. And I would suggest if you compare Rotary to a lot of other uh, well-known NGOs and charities. Let, let's take a few, uh, the RSPCA, uh, Greenpeace, uh, Red Cross, Amnesty International, some of these big names. When you mention those names, people get a very quick um, mind vision of what these organisations stand for. You don't have to describe it. You don't need any sort of mottos. Um, they know immediately when you mention those names what those organisations stand for. I don't think that's the same with Rotary. I think we have to, we have real challenges getting that message out there as to what it is we stand for and what we do. And even the average Rotarian struggles to convey 
that concept uh, of what it is that Rotary stands for. So ineffective communication, the number one four reason, uh, sorry, the number four reason we've had trouble recruiting against our losses. Here is reason number three, the volunteering landscape has changed dramatically over the last 25 years or so. We have not been able to keep up with it. Uh, not for the want of trying though, what I wanna give you here is a very quick glimpse of what Rotary looked like in the 80s. Now, I'll admit I wasn't a Rotary in the 80s, but I was a Rotary actor in the 80s who went to a lot of Rotary meetings. And this is what Rotary looked like to me. And I think if there's any of you in the audience who were around Rotary in the 80s, you'd probably have to agree that it was very much men only. It was formal. It was a lot of out attendance and makeups, rituals, traditions, it was very much the domain of professionals and corporate leaders. And it was, you know, classifications was a big thing. The head tables, the regalia, it was a bit of an elitist organization. But we've had the opportunity through successive uh, council legislation to change a lot of this up uh, over the last, you know, 20, 30 years or so. Just, just think of some of the changes that have been uh, enabled for us to become a more flexible and contemporary organization since then. Of course, the admission of women was the, in my mind, the number one change to uh, bring about better membership outcomes. Uh, we relaxed our qualification criteria. Uh, E-clubs were introduced around about the turn of the century. Uh, we then started to engage, um, to, to sorry, prioritize engagement very much over attendance, which uh, rules were then relaxed. We had some pilot club initiatives um, where clubs around the world got to try some different flexible options. New branding came in in 2013. Yes, believe it or not, that is eight years ago now and still so many people seem to struggle with it. I just can't work that one out for the life of me. Um, then we had um, in the 2016 council legislation, we had the green light for corporate membership flexible meeting options, new club models, uh, and we removed the weekly meeting requirement. And I believe second only to the admission of women, that that option there of removing the weekly meeting requirement was the number two option as far as um, opening up our membership and making us a more flexible and contemporary organization. So we've actually had a lot of opportunities to change Rotary over that time. But here's the thing, I believe in most clubs, maybe not all of them, but right across the Rotary world, we have, people I lovingly refer to as the guardians of the status quo, and they are fighting tooth and nail, tooth and nail to take us back to that sort of 80 styles of rotary because they sort of thought there was really nothing wrong with it. That's something we really need to fight against. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about change management right at the end of my presentation. But I, I guess that the main point I wanna convey there is that, you know, people, people say, you know, RI have these very strict rules. They don't want us to change. I would suggest RI leadership are actually very pro change and they wanna give us tools to try something different. And the problem with the obstinance and, and uh, railing up against change is not about the apex of the organization, but the base. So we do need to look at new ways of doing things. Uh, reason number two that we've struggled to recruit against their losses, we've become obsessed with process, I believe to the detriment of outcomes. I'm just gonna give you a quick list of the sort of things that we get really hung up about in club land, such as meals, menus, venues, sergeants, fines, songs, prayers, collars, flags, bells, clicks, who sits next to whom, who cooks the sausages, when we meet, where we meet, how often we meet. We can get buried down in a lot of this process. And I think what we really need to do is hang our hat on our outcomes like polio eradication, like clean water, like those um, amazing portfolio of youth development programs and the, you know, the, the, the seven international areas of focus. Impact we make in the community, they're the things we really need to be pushing, not get so sort of hung up on the processes. And of course, the biggest process I think we've really got a bit of an obsession with is a pro, uh, an obsession with meetings. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later as well. Here's the number one reason uh, by the length of the strike that we've had trouble uh, recruiting against our losses. We've become comfortable and apathetic. I don't think enough of us want that change and are prepared to work hard enough. Certainly there are some great champions out there of innovation and trying to turn this organization around. But for many of us, it's become really, really comfortable the way it is. And that's the problem with comfort. It's really comfortable. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen these sort of age uh, pie charts, which I'm about to show you. Uh, and I'm going to use that as a bit of an answer to the question, why is such change so hard to implement? So when you have that breakdown of the age groups in Rotary, uh, one thing you learn there is that out there in the general population, 
50% of us are aged under 50. But in Rotary membership, it's only 12% of all Rotary members are aged under 50. So what happens when you ask this question about how we're going to modernise, how we're going to innovate, how we're going to employ, uh, sorry, um, put, it, put in some, some, some new ways of doing things. And when it comes to voting on it, this big group is a really large voting block, the group of over 50s in the organisation. And I recently became one of them. That group of over 50s is 88% of Rotary's membership. And they're a comfortable group. And, and why would they want to change things for that little group of 12 to try and make the organisation more attractive to younger people? I think that's a big reason that we're struggling uh, trying to enforce change in the organisation. I actually see Rotary um, as a big wall of round holes. And I think the older you are, under uh, sorry, over 50, uh, the rounder your peg and, and the more neatly it fits into that wall of round holes, the more comfortable life as a Rotarian is. But the younger you are under 50, the square your peg. And it's a little less comfortable trying to fit you into the round rotary holes. I just don't think people under 50, sadly, fit into the rotary system as well as people over 50. And I think that's something we really need to change. Uh, the other concept I want to run by you is this concept of apathy and not my job. And um, I always include this image in one of my presentations um, that I'm about to show you. A number of years ago, there was a global online competition called the Not My Job Awards. And they asked um, people from all over the world to send a photo, there couldn't be any words in it, that conveyed the concept, not my job. And of all the entries right around the world, this one was the winner of the world competition of the Not My Job Awards. And as you can clearly tell, the line marker decided, well, it wasn't their job to get out and move that log. They've just swerved around it. Now, I put it to you that there are some amazing people in this organisation who work really hard. Uh, they're the first ones to turn up at those projects and the last ones to leave. They put in a lot of effort uh, into making this world an amazing place. Great Rotarians that work hard. But when it comes to membership, like that line marker, they just sort of swerve around it uh, instead of getting out and doing something about it. I suspect for... A lot of Rotarians in clubland, one of the happiest times of the year is when the president-elect is naming their new board members and someone else gets named as the club membership chair. Thank God it's not my job. And uh, Rob will probably be aware of this at district level. Um, you know, that tap on the shoulder, they, we want you to be the district membership chair. I'm sure many people will see that as a poison chalice. So we've all just got to get on that way of thinking that membership is everyone's job. I think that's really, really important. So that's just sort of um, winding up my list of my top five reasons that recruiting against our losses has been so hard. I want to shift focus now because it's no use just talking about a problem if I'm not going to try and solve it as well. And I want to talk about uh, how we can get around changing things to make the organisation particularly more attractive to younger people, but um, to try and get more people into it from all walks of life. And what I want to focus on is what I believe is our most precious resource. And that is the time our members are prepared to give. Okay, the one thing about time is that none of us know how much of it we've got left. And, you know, you can go out and spend your day working in the community, doing great work for Rotary, or you can spend the day at home sitting on the couch. Either way, you're not getting that day back, right? Once it's gone, it's gone. So we have to remember that our time is a really valuable resource. One of the big questions I used to get asked when I was district membership chair and, and still get asked quite a bit is where are all the members coming from? Where are we gonna find these new members? So what I wanna do now is just a quick little exercise. I wanna show you a few different sort of groups of people. And I wanna ask the question, how much spare time do you think they're gonna have? So let's just sort of start nipping through this group. I'll, I'll go through it as quickly as I can, but that's the question I want you to ask. You're gonna, you're gonna see types of people that you think, yeah, they'd be great to get more of them into Rotary, but let's ask that question, how much spare time are they gonna have? Let's start out with some young uh, university students, okay? So just put yourself in their shoes. Full-time uni, maybe got a part-time job. Possibly they have sporting commitments or other hobbies. They also want to spend time with their families. How much spare time do you think university students have got? I would suggest not a lot. Let's just move on to the next group now. Excuse me. Young people starting out in their career path, their first full-time job. How much spare time do you think they're going to have? So they're working full time, uh, maybe doing some overtime to impress the boss or to earn a bit of extra cash or to sort of work their way um, up the corporate ladder. How much spare time do you think they're going to have? And likewise, they probably have family commitments, sporting commitments. Let's move on to the next group. The small business owners. Now, that's been me for probably 
20 years or so, and a big part of our Rotary membership base. And again, how much spare time do these people have? They're usually the first people in the morning opening up, the last people at night locking up, and they're up at night doing bookkeeping and payroll and that sort of stuff. Um, they don't have a lot of spare time. Here's another group we talk about a bit in Rotary. We talk a bit about being a family-friendly organisation. Uh, and look, to be fair, some clubs have, have got a really good family-friendly culture, but a lot of clubs don't. And, uh, you know, I've been through that time of life where it's all about nappies and bottles and those trips to the supermarket that used to take you five minutes, but now you got to pack all the kids in a pram and it's an hour. Um, one person working hard, one person looking after kids, uh, sometimes both parents working, juggling kids around with childcare. It's a really challenging time of life. And again, how much spare time do young parents with young families have? Not a lot, I would suggest. Uh, now, this is the the, uh, the corporate executives, the, the high flyers. Not that too many are flying too far at the moment, but um, this used to be the domain of Rotary, the sort of um, captains of industry and the doctors and the lawyers, um, the sales reps, the, the, the executives. These people are putting in more time at work probably than any other group. So, again, how much time, how much spare time do you think these people have? Um now, everything's about to change when I show you this next slide, okay, because we've been questioning how much spare time these people have from a perspective of will they make great Rotarians, will they be able to make a contribution, will they uh, enjoy the value proposition that Rotary gives. This is all going to change when I show you the next group, the retirees. Now, comparatively, I think you'll all agree, these people have a lot more spare time and a lot more flexibility uh, over how they use their spare time. Of course, they give up a lot of time to do the babysitting and look after the grandkids. And I've, I've personally benefited from that, so that's great. But I think collectively, they have a lot more spare time. So when we ask that question, why is Rotary dominated by retirees? Here's a very, a very simple answer. They're the ones with the time. They're the ones with the time. Now, it also, I think, comes a bit down to that thing I said about before about being the round pegs in the round hole. I think Rotary sort of suits them a lot better. But um, at, at the end of the day, they're the ones with the spare time. Now, I want to be very clear in this. This is not an anti um, a or an ageist sort of commentary. I'm just saying how it is. I don't have any problem whatsoever about having so many retirees in the organisation. I think it's fabulous. They're the backbone of the organisation. We'd be stuffed without them. So this is not a, a let's get rid of the oldies campaign. I just like to see us more attractive to a younger market, being able to introduce more young people. This is not a zero sum game. We can keep the senior people in the organisation and hang on to them for their experience uh, and their mentoring, um, their availability during the day. Um, it's really important to keep those people engaged as well. But I would like to see a more contemporary organisation where we can perhaps attract more younger people in as well. So I want to do a little exercise here, um, just do it in your head, but I want you to think about the amount of time you commit to Rotary in a, now I'd, I'd stress here, a normal Rotary year, and clearly we haven't had a normal Rotary year. Just think about the total time you would normally commit, and I think I know um, the calculations you're going to do to work this out. Just think of it as a big circle, and then work out, out of that total time that you commit to Rotary in a normal year, uh, including getting to and from and being at meetings, how much time are we spending on meetings? I think, you know, when I did my research, I, I was a bit shocked myself to find this out, but the average Rotarian was spending between 60 and 75% of the total time they committed to Rotary in a year in either being at or getting to and from meetings. I, I think that's um, very disproportionate. I, I don't think that's reasonable. I think we're expecting way too much of our members to spend that much time in meetings because what it does then, everything else we sort of do in Rotary, you know, the, the, the training events, uh, events such as this, the service projects, the fundraising events, uh, and just the socialising, everything else has to be squeezed into that last sort of 25 to 40%. And I think for a lot of you, you probably haven't seen it represented this way before and it can come as a bit of a shock. I think we really need to do something about this. I think it's a bit of a problem that we need to address. Just excuse me. <coughs> Um, now, I just want to give you another list of questions about meetings here. That these are the sort of questions that generally come up at district assemblies and training events. Uh, and when you're doing a bit of introspection about how your club's going, really simple questions, and I'd hope most of them you can give an answer to. Are our meetings interesting? Are they welcoming? Are they punctual? Are they run professionally? Are our guest speakers informative? 
are our meetings good value? And of course, for those who are actually back to meeting in the pub or the restaurant, I'm not sure where you're quite at there yet. You know, is the food and service good at our meeting venues? These, of course, are all legitimate, reasonable questions we need to be asking about our meetings. And I would hope for most of you, you can put a tick next to most of those boxes. What I'm gonna do now is ask you the one question and have a good hard think about this one, about your meetings that never gets asked, but I think is really important and we desperately have to ask. And those of you who like to take notes, write this down, okay, here it comes. Are our meetings a productive and effective use of our volunteers' time? Now, this is a question that often gets people sort of scratching their heads. And when I'm talking to a live audience, you can see the sort of stunned look in the audience as they're trying to reconcile with this because suddenly starting, people are starting to think, well, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And I think this is a really important question to ask. Um, as we've just seen, you know, busy people don't have a lot of spare time to give. So it's really important that the time they give be effective and productive. This is really, really important. And this is coming to the nub of why we're having trouble, particularly with younger, but not just younger people, but getting people to join the organisation, okay? Um, I did a, a, quite a few surveys in the process of um, researching for my book, and I just want to include some responses from, from this question about what people value in meetings. I want to share that with you. So the top two responses I got, or there are thousands of responses, what I did was sort of um, uh, consolidate them and bring them down to sort of one-word answers because there's a lot of answers that are very similar. The number one thing uh, that people wanted and enjoyed from their meetings was the entertainment value. Um, you know, hearing a fun, uh, a fun sergeant session, hopefully, an informative speaker, a good meal. And number two was camaraderie. They're the top two things that Rotarians uh, wanted and appreciated uh, from their meetings. Uh, and look, for the record, I think they're both really important, okay? And I would suggest most, most clubs tend to get both of those right, and that's great. But here's what I discovered, because um, I thought there was sort of something missing from the responses I was getting and the responses that sort of came to the, you know, were most popular. It suddenly dawned on me, of course, that 88% of our membership base is over 50. So these responses were being dominated by people over 50s. What I then decided to do is drill down into the data a little bit closer and get some responses just from people under 50. And these two answers may really surprise a lot of you about what younger people are looking for from meetings that maybe senior people aren't. Here's the number one answer. They want productivity. Now, I've been guilty in the past of thinking that young people just aren't interested in meetings. Some of them aren't, and that's true. But what they're not interested in is unproductive meetings, meetings for the sake of holding a meeting. If your meeting is about addressing some community need or planning some fundraiser or event or uh, looking at who's falling through the cracks in society and trying to address it, Young people are up for that. They see that as a productive use of their time. If your meeting is some speaker that, you know, may not interest them, that's, that's what they don't see as a productive use of their time. Here's number two, networking. It's what younger people are looking for from meetings. Um, they want that uh, mentoring. They want the introductions to the business networks out there. But again, as I mentioned before, uh, with fewer of our members uh, in gainful employment, there's those networks uh, aren't quite there anymore. So, Maybe there's a capacity to make your meetings more productive and actually do something rather than just meet. Maybe there's a capacity to hold some uh, specific networking events where you invite the local sort of chamber of business or have a joint meeting with them. When sort of in-person meetings are, are again available, and again, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's happening in your part of the world. Um, so I gave two ticks to those ones at the top. I've got to say, when I think of most clubs, I've got to put question marks against these two bottom ones. I think they're a work in progress for a lot of clubs. And this one slide is a snapshot of what we are offering and what people want and what people aren't getting um, from our meeting environment. Really important. I, I somehow think that we've managed to put meetings right at the center of the Rotary universe. I don't know how this has happened, but everything else we do seems to have to revolve around meetings. Uh, we sort of view them as the epitome of Rotary life. And, and I, I don't think that should be the case. What I'd like to see, this is the model I'd like to see, instead of meetings at the centre of the Rotary Universe, I want to see service at the centre of the Rotary Universe. And everything else we do revolve around service, including meetings. I think that's a, a more sustainable model. And I think it's what particularly younger people are looking for. Here is the number one rule of one of our great entrepreneurs of our time who a few years ago released this six rules. 
uh, that he gave out to all of his uh, business units. The number one rule, unless there's a specific purpose for a meeting, don't have one. That was his number one rule. What do we do in Rotary? We do the exact opposite of that. Whether there's a meeting, whether there's a reason for it or not, we just have meetings. Um, and, and I think we can learn a lot from Elon and his, and his number one rule there. Question what value is coming from our meetings, okay? Uh, in, in addition to the sort of camaraderie and entertainment value. Now, we're getting to the end of my presentation here. Um, and I thought it was important to include this slide. There's a bit of a story that goes with this slide. Um, and this is about change management. Um, the number one thing that stops people implementing change in Rotary Clubs is this uh, morbid fear that if we change anything, members are going to leave. Of course, over the last 12 months, we've seen more change in Rotary than we probably have in the previous sort of 114 years. But that's why a lot of changes don't get, you know, they get thought about, they get discussed, but they don't actually get implemented. This fear that if we change too much, people are going to leave. Uh, what I'm going to do here is say that um, I agree that sometimes when you change things, some people leave. This slide is about the pace of change, okay? Are we moving too fast? Are we moving too slow? And whilst I'm prepared to admit that, yes, we have historically lost members because they felt the pace of change has been too fast, I will guarantee you we have lost five times as many members because they felt the pace of change has been too slow. And that doesn't even take into account those tens of thousands of people who've never joined us in the first place because the pace of change in our organisation is too slow and we're not offering something attractive to them. So I just, I just give that little slide to you as, a, as a, a bit of encouragement to those of you who are the change makers out there. Don't be put off by this concept that, oh, if we change things, we're going to lose people. We're already losing people and I think it's because we're moving too slow, not too fast. Uh, and this is my final slide. Uh, at the end of the presentation today. Um, what I want to offer you is a lens. And the beauty of a lens is that when you look through a lens, things are a lot clearer on the other side. The lens I want you to look through that everything you do in Rotary, not just meetings, but everything you do in Rotary is this lens. And it is a lens of productivity and effective use of time. Just ask that question. Are we utilising our most important resource, which is our members' time that they're prepared to give? Are we utilising that to its fullest? Or are we perhaps wasting some of that time? Are we uh, not respecting that spare time that some people have very little of? So look at everything you do through a process, uh, through a lens, sorry, of productivity and effective use of time. And bit by bit, try and change the way you think doing things, make for a more contemporary and popular organisation. I'm going to wind up there. Thanks very much for inviting me along, uh, DG Alice. And I'll try and unshare. There we go. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, Pleasure. Are there any questions for Mark? We have a few minutes that Mark can take some questions before he has to go off to bed. It's only eight o'clock. I don't quite have to go to bed yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't want to eat into your time, but I'm more than happy to take questions. Uh, Phil Ross at Kirimua, Phil. Uh, Mark, thank you. Uh, I was listening to Barry Rassin the other day uh, talking about shaping Rotary's future, and I'm not sure whether you're involved in that, but he was saying... Uh, that I'm not, but I have seen that presentation. He was saying that uh, uh, in the last 10 years, we've been about 1.2 million members, and but over that time... Uh, we've recruited 1.4 million members. Mm. And so he characterized it as not as a recruitment problem, but as a retention problem. And I wonder if we're basically selling the wrong product. I hear people who've joined and then left sort of say, it wasn't what I expected. Uh, sitting in meetings, planning meetings is just not much fun. And I wonder whether you agree with that. Uh, I do. I, I, um, I have heard this commentary that we don't have a recruitment problem, we have a retention problem. What I would suggest is that we absolutely have both problems, um, particularly in the Western world where we are unable to recruit against our losses. Um, I mean, membership is going really well in developing nations, uh, subcontinent, Southeast Asia, uh, um, Eastern Europe, Africa. Africa is going gangbusters uh, for membership. So um, there, is a, there is a popular product out there for the right market. But uh, yeah, this, this whole revolving door of membership, um, I think there's, there's a certain place for a certain amount of churn in Rotary to get new ideas in the door. I think it's necessary. And I think there's also this concept, although it's a bit um, crass maybe, that you've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find a prince. 
Um, not everyone is going to be suitable for rotary, but the more people we can get in through the door to give it a try, I think the better chance we're going to find some great long-term Rotarians. So I'm, I'm all for giving people a try, but yeah, we, we need to change the product we're serving up. Um, um, it, it's, it's, it's not so much a marketing problem, I think, as a product problem. And, and I think it all comes down to this thing about how we use, how we use time, but um, very impressed with everything Barry Rassen says, I've got to be honest. Thanks, Thank you. Philip. That was good. Thanks, Mark. Uh, John Milne, please. Hi, John. Hi, Mark. Mark, Mark that, was, that was ringing all kinds of bells for me. Um, can I just mention one thing briefly and then ask a question? The gift of time, I think, is a very helpful phrase. I do a presentation over here with wearing different hats. It's called the gift relationship. It's got three phrases. The offer of self, the gift of time, one hour given freely. And I think that's what was coming right through your presentation in different ways. The, the second question is, I've been looking at trying to develop the concept of alumni in 1010 since 2016, and we've developed the handbook, and I'm going to be working closely with Arthur Rob in the next couple of years to try and develop it further. Part of what I've come to be aware of in that concept and, and learning from other voluntary organisations, and I'd be interested in your experience, do we make it very difficult for people to remain in contact with Rotary because it's too much an either or? You've either become a member and we're chasing you, or you're not a member. And if we could develop the concept of alumni wider than the concept of former members, I think we've got ways of developing networks that let people contribute gifts of time to Rotary in different ways. I would I'd value your thoughts on that, Mark. Uh, I agree with everything you say. I think we've got an amazing alumni network out there, but, um, you know, we often, particularly the, the the kids that come through youth programs, they, 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 for many of them, Rotary has changed their lives, but they come back to our club because they give their presentation and we sort of wave them off into the sunset, never see them again. We need to be involving them in our, you know, service projects, our fundraisers, our barbecues, um, but we can't leave it 10 years and they go, we haven't heard of this person now, we have to chase them up. Uh, the other thing, which, um, and I, I don't want to, I'm conscious of time here, but um, we, we had a meeting in my, my district has recently merged with another district, okay, uh, July 1 last year. And leading up to that merger, um, we, we had a meeting with a lot of alumni and Rotaractors and Rylarians and, and even young Rotarians under 40. We got them all in a room just to ask them about the future of Rotary and what they thought. And it, it, I was just a fly on the wall, but it was an amazing event. There would have been 50 people there under 40. And what I was amazed by was the collective love for Rotary in the room. It, it was very apparent. But then it came to the question, well, how do we get you into Rotary? And, and, uh, and now some of them were already in Rotary, uh, three or four. Virtually all of them said the same thing. You know, I love this organisation, but I just couldn't join my sponsor club. They just didn't have uh, a feeling that there was a club suitable for them in the district. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big person on getting new clubs started up. And we need to, and I've started a club, so I've been through the process. It's one of those build it and they will come things. If we can provide these new club options that are completely different to the way traditional clubs run, that doesn't mean traditional clubs have to be flushed down the toilet, but we need to do a bit more and and not so much or. They are out there, but we need to build a product suitable for them. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Jim Houston, please. You're muted, Jim. Jim, you're muted. Sorry. Hello, Jim. Hello there, Mark. Um, I've been in sales for 35 years and um, we have a little uh, saying, you don't sell the sausage, you sell the sizzle. And um, I've try, tried to get individual members to think about how to bring people in. But do you, you talked about what you talked about, I think, is it more appropriate to the um, more developed rotary places or parts of the world like Australia, New Zealand, uh, America, UK? It seems that in the other cases where, where there is a burgeoning um, membership, it's still seen as an elite organisation and a place to be. You want, if you're in rotary, you've achieved a certain status in your community where perhaps in Western countries, it's a different, a different approach is needed to engage people. Um, 
that's a very important question. Um, Fortunately, it takes about an hour to answer properly, but we, we actually have a very much a two-paced system going on with the growth in the developing world that do see Rotary as elite and see as Rotary as progressive. And, and a lot of it comes down to what's going on in society. Rotary is going into those communities and digging bore wells and providing clinics and schools. And we're seen as changing lives. Whereas in Australia and I dare say the UK and the developed countries, a lot of people will ask the question, why is Rotary even relevant? We've got relatively good education and free healthcare and roads. And now we can always do better, of course. But when you compare against some of these developing countries, people will say, well, why do you need service organisations? So it's up, up to us to prove are relevant uh, in these societies where some people see us as a bit sort of passe, um, as opposed to in these developing countries where we're seen as something elite, something they want to get into. Um, I've actually written a whole chapter about it in my book, but I, so I won't go on about it here but yeah very much a, a two-paced membership in fact the membership isn't really um changing it's redistributing um with that growth in the in the only reason we've stayed at 1.2 million for 20 years is the staggering growth in the developing nations such as india and africa uh to offset the staggering decline in traditional strongholds such as australia uk north america um japan um those westernized countries um it, it's a very complex sort of problem but um it's about making us relevant i think i remember doing my dg training in san diego at a round table uh, discussion there was a chap from the us who was saying their club helps uh, families of servicemen because they're not well supported in the us and quite often need quite a lot of support then there was someone from finland who the state looks after them from cradle, cradle to grave and they struggle to find projects, service projects in their country that Rotary could get involved in. Um, and it, it varies, you know, the UK has got a bit of both, you know, there's still lots of need around it within the country as well as um, tying in with clubs in the developing world as well. So it's, it's uh, what you've done is very, is a very broad and I think it's very relevant. I've mentioned this already in a, in a, a chat, but I think uh, it's complex as well. And of course, we get down to individual clubs as the ones who deliver the message. And that's, yes, that is a, a big issue as well. Mm. well Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Um, final question, please, from Kath Chorley. Thanks very much. Hi, Mark. You might recall that um, at one point I was arranging accommodation for you over here in Scotland when you were actually going to come in person. So it's well, great to just, be... Just keep the electric blanket on, I'll get out of this. We, have, we, we are doing, don't <laughs> worry. We're keeping, we're keeping the room free for you. Um, I'm not so much a question, Mark, just a, a statement. I think you know a little bit about my background and others do here that I'm a member of a club that uh, is not yet 18 months old, uh, has a wide age range, more women than men, and through our COVID difficulties has kept going with projects, most, uh, mostly uh, providing a children's clothing bank. But what I, the point I'd like to make is, first of all, my experience of, of all the people in the club, myself included, I think, is that we don't really have much time for meetings. Um, we have a lot of time for giving service. Uh, and we have a lot of time for discussing how we're going to give service, usually on a WhatsApp conversation. So if I can bear with the yeah, clothing bank for a moment, we'll get a, a reference. I'm not going to have you do that, but we get a reference and the leader of the clothing bank will say, can anybody help today? And within seconds and at worst minutes, somebody will respond. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that, um, and it was particularly so over here when people volunteered way back at the beginning of the pandemic last year in March to help with the National Health Service, is that volunteers these days, and I should stress, I have absolutely nothing against traditional clubs, but thinking of the future, volunteers these days don't want to spend their time talking about it. They want to spend their time doing it. And if we invent clubs that do that, we will get far more members. So I just want to endorse the fact that it, we are meeting centric in general, but if we move away from that, we've got people queuing up. We actually have people, young people coming to say, how do you join us? How do we get part of this? So I thought your um, 
talk was extraordinary and refreshing. I knew it'd be good because I've been watching your YouTubes anyway. Uh, but I think for those of us who are on today, what, what really we need to do is to support DJ Alistair, who's going to be our membership chair next year, and get these new clubs going. Keep the old ones, the traditional ones, the established ones there, but get the new clubs going. So, Mark, more a comment than a, a question. Thanks, Kath. I hope to spend some time in your spare bed someday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining us, Mark. Uh, loads and loads for us to think about there. I'm sure the people listening will go away today with some new ideas about membership and, and maybe maybe just a, a, a different, refreshing way of looking at things. If anyone would like a copy of Mark's book, um, and I have it here, it's getting a bit thumbed at the corners now, my copy. Um, but if anyone would like a copy of Mark's book, I do have a colleague in District 1110 who has around 20 spares, uh, which he's happy to sell. So please get in touch um, if you'd like one and I'll get it arranged for you. But honestly, well worth, uh, well worth a read. It's, it's a fantastic book. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, hope to get over there in person one day. <laughs> All the best. Thanks, Mark. Good morning. Bye-bye. So, uh, next it's back to four charities in, in four minutes. And earlier we heard from representatives from Love Oliver, the Buckhaven and Methyl Miners Brass Band, Instant Neighbour in Aberdeen, and Charlie House, also in the Aberdeen area. Four very worthy charities, I'm sure you'll agree, and four very compelling pitches from them. But as we know, only one can win the £1,000 prize from the district. I'm trying to build up the tension here, but I'd make a rotten quiz show host, I think, wouldn't I? So, without further ado, I'll ask my invisible assistant for the winning envelope. Thank you very much. And the winner of the four charities in four minutes are Aberdeen St Marker and Charlie House. So, congratulations. Um, we'll get your details and pass them on to the district treasurer and he'll make sure that money is, is transferred uh, to the Charlie House account as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Alistair. You're welcome. Thank you all for voting and, and taking part in the four charities in four minutes. We're now going to break for some lunch, uh, but this afternoon we're going to have talks from the Rotary Club of Dundee, the Rotary Peace Scholar, Homaira, from Jennifer Jones, Rob Kennedy, Rota Kids, and also Professor Hugh Pennington. So the, the Zoom room will open again at one o'clock for chat, and the conference itself will restart around 1.15. Um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing you all then. So enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you at one o'clock. <laughs>